Intel virtualization and AMD virtualization does is it kind of sort of introduces a notion of a ring negative one, which is where the hypervisor itself lives. And what happens is once it's installed and once the trap handlers are set up and once it's configured to intercept certain operations, certain instructions, like we said, instead of talking directly to the hardware, talk to our trap handler instead. And what you get is when you issue one of these instructions, like trying to read a model specific register from the chipset, right? What happens is you get what's called a VM exit, which is the guest operating system, OS 10, exiting from ring zero and dropping down to the hypervisor to actually implement that instruction. And for the most part, what happens when you do that is the hypervisor itself issues the real instruction, right? So if you're trying to read an MSR from the chipset, for instance, um, you, the hypervisor itself would proxy that request directly through. It's going to allow most of those requests to go through unscathed. It's going to get the results. It's going to populate the state of the computer to emulate the effect of that instruction. And it's going to return control back to the guest operating system. That transaction is called a VM exit which is exiting from the guest operating system, and a VM entrance, which is returning control back to the guest operating system. Now, like we said before, the hyperjacker gets to pick and choose which ones of these operations are actually going to be virtualized. So certain things, certain ways of talking to the hardware are not intercepted by the hyperjacker. For instance, certain interrupts and things like that will pass directly to the hardware, will not get trapped by a hyperjacker because it's not emulating everything. But certain other things will cause VM exits, and some of those things have to happen. Some of those um, VM exits and VM entrances are mandatory. Um, so, we've been talking so far about how vitriol works and generally what vitriol is, and I just want to contrast this with um, Joanna's blue pill. Um, some of you guys may be familiar with the challenge that we, uh, that we issued to Joanna. We didn't expect to get as much PR from that as uh, we actually did, but um, Dino Dysovi and Joanna Rakowska released hypervisor malware, released hardware virtualized malware um, last year at Black Hat simultaneously. Um, and their implementations, the underlying implementations are somewhat similar, but Joanna's is different in a couple of different ways, right? Joanna's hypervisor rootkit uses the AMD virtualization um, set, which is compatible enough with Intel's virtualization that Zen treats them almost like the same thing. Um, hers affects, infects Vista and not OS X. Ours is an OS X rootkit, hers is a Vista one. She has a clever way of loading her rootkit. We didn't come up with a way to compromise the OS X kernel. There are probably already plenty of other good ways to compromise the OS X kernel. We didn't come up with a new one. Um, hers implements network I.O. Dino's uh, slide deck from last year has, you know, as soon as we figure out how to do um, network I.O. with uh, Vitrio, we'll tell you how that works. Then we went to the conference and saw Joanna present hers, and it's like, you know, <laughs> why didn't we think of that? But um, Joanna uses the debug registers in the machine to intercept the network stack calls, to intercept frames coming to the machine. And using that, she's loaded an entire IP stack into her hypervisor, which is just damn cool, right? We haven't weaponized our rootkit to the extent that she's weaponized her rootkit. Ours um, is more of a proof of concept than hers is. And then she's done more things than we have with our rootkit to prevent people from detecting her. So for instance, um, you can virtualize the running machine um, and ostensibly when you do that, you should be exposing all the operations of the underlying machine, including virtualization itself. That's nested virtual machines. So in a, in a virtualized version of Vista, you should be able to you know, run other virtualized guest operating systems under that. You can't do that with ours. If you issue VM instructions in ours, we trap out. Um, Joanna is actually apparently implements, you know, as she said, you know, she implements nested virtual machines. Um, we don't know the extent to which she does or doesn't do that. What we're doing is we're giving her the benefit of the doubt. What we want to talk about are ways to detect um, hardware virtualized rootkits, um, even assuming that she's implemented everything that we can come up with that you could possibly implement to evade these ty types of attacks. But let's make it clear that she's done more than we have to make her rootkit harder to detect. And then her central claim from her talk was, this is the foundation. Blue Pill itself is not 100% undetectable, but it's the foundation of a path that takes us to 100% undetectable malware. And we're really interested in debunking that claim. We're not sure that anything is 100% deductible, uh, undetectable. And we think it's a really interesting challenge to go back and forth between us and her to see whether or not this is true. And I think it's hard to prove whether or not your stuff is 100% undetectable if you don't have an adversary trying to detect you. And that's what we're trying to provide here. So here's the central claim of our talk, which is that nothing is 100% undetectable. Every potential uh, rootkit that's been out there has found, we found ways to detect it. So um, Peter is going to talk a little bit about um, detecting software virtualization. So when people talked about virtualization previously, uh, most people thought about the, the software-based uh, virtualization. And no one seriously thinks those are undetectable anymore. We have, for example, in uh, 
virtual PC and VMware, uh, emulated uh, hardware, which is, uh, in the case of uh, VMware, the uh, chipset is from the Bill Clinton present era, and it's really, really old now. We have the holes in virtualization itself that, uh, as demonstrated by Red Pill, the SIDT instruction reveals that uh, the system is virtualized. In the case of uh, virtual PC, we have a motherboard whose manufacturer is Microsoft, despite them claiming they're not in the hardware business. In the case of uh, registry keys, that uh, at least when uh, the tools are installed in VMware, they will import uh, registry keys from the host into the guest session. And while these are easy to remove, the strings that appear in the video and system BIOS are not quite so easy to remove, and there are many, many of those. There's also the guest to host communication channels. There's an explicit API for both VMware and virtual PC. In the case of VMware, a simple I.O. port is accessed uh, using particular registers. You can transfer memory and data back and forth. In the case of virtual PC, they use illegal instructions and illegal encodings of certain instructions. But in the same way, that uh, you can transfer memory to and from the, uh, the host of the guest and vice versa. The uh, timing variances are visible after a while as well, because you can query the uh, read TSC, which is very, very difficult to trap for a software-based virtualization. And because the host can be queried for the real time using this API, you can see that the numbers diverge after the host has been uh, running for a little while. So, Clearly, uh, the software-based virtualization is, is very easy to detect, and we think the same thing for the hardware-based virtualization. And we, we thought it was kind of important to point out um, the fact that software virtualization is straightforward to detect, because like all of you, we take our cues on how to secure things and what is possible and what is not possible from Slashdot comments. And our story got Slashdotted, and before this talk, we actually read through all the different plus five comments that were on Slashdot about whether it would be possible for us to detect Blue Pill. And a lot of them came down to things like, well, they're running VMware, and VMware is undetectable because it controls everything. And if you take away one thing from this slide, it's that if you're using something like a heavyweight virtual machine monitor, like a heavyweight hypervisor, like VMware provides, it's providing a complete containment environment that makes no attempt whatsoever to hide the fact that you are virtualized. If you are running malware containment environments that are trying to run things in simulation, it's more likely that you're gonna see malware that takes advantage of virtualization by hiding itself when it detects that it's virtualized than it is that you are likely to see malware that's going to implement hardware virtualization. Do not assume that your malware cannot detect the fact that you're virtualized. Software virtualization is trivial to detect. Um, kind of the research project that we're working on right now started when we read Peter Ferry's paper, which introduced one of the detection mechanisms that we're gonna talk about later for hardware, but also just a huge variety of different ways to detect different hypervisors, such as parallels, um, which you can detect and crash with a single instruction, or VMware. Um, so software virtualization is trivial to detect. So we wanted to give you guys a mental model of how you think about different rootkits and the layers that they're implemented at. For instance, here's a typical kernel malware where, for instance, maybe it just infects one system call or just the SSDT in Windows. And it's, it's a very small hook into the operating system. And it does its best to hide from other aspects of the operating system. And it has a wide variety of places where it can insert little bits here and there to try to hide itself. And it's difficult to detect kernel malware often because there's so many possibilities there. With x86 hardware, um, it tends to have a huge cross-section because there's so many different um, variants of it. There's so many different um, components to it, and it pre presents a really large cross-section. So keep this metric of cross-section in your mind as we're talking about this. We call it basically the amount of the original system that a rootkit must emulate to remain hidden. So the rootkit has two choices. It can either leave things unemulated and just pass them through, or it can try to emulate the entire behavior of that and trap all the behavior. And try to avoid ha having any um, detectable difference between it and the actual hardware. Well, both of these result in a situation that's bad for the rootkit. Because in the first case, if it tries to trap, and if it fails to trap and emulate a, f a feature, then we just use that feature to detect the rootkit. On the other hand, if it tries to trap and emulate a complex feature, let's say the cache behavior of 15 different models of Intel or AMD CPU, uh, you end up with a ton of code there, and that code has a, a huge code base, 
It has a huge footprint, has huge cross-section. And the side effects of that code and potential bugs in that code and things like that make it very easily detectable. So in either situation, if you take it to extreme, you end up in a situation where the rootkit author is at a disadvantage. And remember, the, the entire x86 hardware platform, is, it's a huge cross-section. There, there are so many different um, CPUs, as we talked about before, microarchitectural details, and all these are observable from a targeted detection algorithm. So, I mean, if there's one point that we want to make in the whole talk for you guys to take away is you can, you can measure almost any piece of malware by its cross-section. JavaScript malware has a cross-section. Kernel malware has a cross-section. Um, firmware malware that lives inside of the op-roms in your, in your you know, different peripherals has a cross-section. And if you want to evaluate malware by the size of its cross-section, by the likelihood that it's going to miss something or screw something up that you can detect, the entire x86 platform is a poor choice to actually attempt to insert yourself. It's much better to insert yourself in the kernel. You have a million different places that you can hide there. There are kind of nuclear options that you have to detect kernel malware, but they're not the most common options. Whereas if you're virtualizing yourself, you have one single fixed stationary target. Are you virtualized when you did not expect to be virtualized? And that's the cross-section that we want to exploit here. A good example is the CPU ID instruction. It actually has a mandatory exit, meaning that you have to trap it, or it causes a, a trap whenever you have a hypervisor loaded. And in its normal behavior, CPU ID has a very specific small footprint. It only takes a few cycles. It doesn't touch memory, doesn't touch the cache, doesn't touch anything else. It just basically stores a few values in the registers. And if you're virtualized, it has a huge impact because there are microarchitectural things that happen because you're jumping and running an entire VM exit handler. You're, you're transferring control to things at the instruction level, which then have microarchitectural impact later on. And this make, is what makes it easy to detect. Uh, you know, what I think is when, when it's actually, when, when we do questions towards the end, we can get you a mic and I can hear the question better. Also, um, we're introducing this concept of side channel attacks and things like that, which will introduce themselves many, many, many questions. Please evaluate our talk by whether we answer those questions before you have to ask the question. Um, so I'm sorry if it's taking us a while to kind of get to the point on this, but we're getting to it right now, actually, which is... Um, we think that all the strategies that we're going to use or that people are going to use to inevitably detect hardware virtualized malware are going to fall into one of three strategies. The first strategy is side channel attacks. Now, for the past blah number of years, in the very next slide that we have, Nate's going to talk more about this um, for reasons that will become clear. We've been using timing analysis and resource consumption analysis of different systems um, to detect things about how the system is running. Namely, we can use timing variances, power consumption variances, things like that to reverse individual key bits out of RSA implementations and AES implementations. Um, if we could do that to break crypto algorithms, we're in a much better setting um, when we own the computer and ostensibly the hardware underneath it to detect virtualization. So that first strategy is side channel analysis, to do things to detect places where virtualization perturbs the normal operation of the system. The second strategy is what we call vantage point attacks. And Nate just talked about it a second ago. We have a dilemma here, which is that in order to allow the system to be feasibly implemented, so we don't have to spend 16 man years actually building it, um, in order to actually allow the system to be feasible, we don't implement all of the hardware that's supposed to run there. We allow certain requests of the hardware to pass directly through without being intercepted. Well, if you forget important ones, then the actual guest operating system, which is actively trying to detect you, can talk directly to the hardware. And in a variety of cases, the hardware will betray you if you're the malware author. Um, so there are a whole bunch of places that you have to catch and make sure that you emulate, even though to get functionality working properly, you didn't have to emulate them. However, 